and now we catch up with Rod 16 years later. He's now in his 50s in July of 2020. Enjoy. Welcome to Kindness Magazine, Rod Coronado. I'm so thrilled to have you here because you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but you're one of my favorite people in the whole world. And because oh. you have accomplished things that I've only fantasized about. You've released wild horses. Mm. So cool. Uh, tell me how that felt. Uh, first of all, thank you for mm. having me on Kindness Magazine, Brenda. And it's good to see you again. It's been a long time, but I'm glad we're connecting again. And I am happy to be speaking with you and your supporters and followers. And I hope that uh, we have time for a good conversation. Um, you know, I've, I'm, I'm a very blessed man. I've been very fortunate uh, because of the things that I've been able to participate in in my life. You know, you mentioned wild horse, rescuing wild horses from BLM facilities in the 1980s and 90s. And that this was incredible. You, know. you sunk a whaling, two whaling ships. Oh my God. Talk about a dream. You've done so many amazing things to help animals. Well, I had some great teachers, some great elders who, who taught me by example. You know, Paul Watson is still my captain and always will be. He's uh, also my elder. You know, uh, there's, there's so many people that I've been fortunate to share my life with. You know, Ben White, uh, Cleveland Amory, you know, elders like Anselmo Valencia Torrey and uh, elders like Albert Whitehat of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And elders like LaDonna Brave Bull of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, lots of people who have um, shared with me, you know, their journeys, which were equally as challenging as any that I've embarked in, if not more. And so uh, I've had some great uh, people to follow an example of. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for reminding me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, not only that, but, you know, the bravery that you you expressed and that you actually were willing to sacrifice your own freedom and you did go to prison for those things many times, I think is something that of course most people are not willing to do. And so for those of us in society who benefit from people like you who are willing to make huge sacrifices to see change made in society and to bring attention to these issues, I thank you. I'm very grateful and blessed for having the experiences that I've been able to have and and the closeness to to animals and nature that those things have brought me. Uh, you know, when you, you know, I remember in 1987, I think it was, when I saw the animals film mm -hmm. and learned for the first time about veal production. And that night, me and my girlfriend went out and we started a fire at a veal packing plant in San Jose, California. Like that to me was what was called for, you know, uh, when you see an injustice taking place amongst you as, as we are seeing today, not just with animals, but with people as well. And uh, it, it's, it's very inspiring to see the new generations of people taking to the streets and the support that others are giving them. Um, you know, I've waited a long time in my life for this, you know. Uh, I was able to be at Standing Rock and have that feeling of being amongst thousands of indigenous people from all different tribes. And I remember one man telling me to go home and tell people what it feels like to be free. Mm. And I'll never forget that. And that's how I feel right now is I feel free because of those things that I've been able to do. I very much feel free. Wow. That's so beautiful. And the fact that you, like I say, took on that risk, but I think that other people who are, watching this, especially young people who are not aware of the ALF actions that have occurred in the past and maybe haven't even heard the name Rod Coronado yet. They need to know there was a strong credo of making sure that no person or animal ever was injured in any of your actions. Yeah, I'm really fortunate in that, uh, you know, I mean, that's the one thing that even my elders told me when I was a fugitive living on the Pasquayaki Indian Reservation, my elder who gave me sanctuary told me he could help me and he could protect me, uh, not just physically, but also in the spiritual world. But he said only if I had never taken a life. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just said that, you know, once you've crossed over that line and you've taken another human life, there's just, you know, there's a spiritual price to be paid. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, and I think it's easy for us right now to be polarized and to see 
people who represent things that we very much don't believe in and to direct our anger towards them, but, it, but it's a trap, you know, it's a trap towards their very much vision is, is that, you know, when you, when you take that bait and you fall into their anger and you give it right back to them, you know, you're playing into their hands, you know, and so this is a very important time to, to be out in the streets and to take a stand, but to always remember that life is sacred and that, you know, we have to maintain the moral high ground. You know, we're not the, the ones that have introduced diseases and pandemics to people. You know, we're not the ones that are running factory farms and animal research laboratories. We're not the ones that are imprisoning immigrant youth. We're not the ones that are trafficking young native women. We're not the ones that are killing young black people. You know, we don't want any part of that. You know, we don't want any part of that belief structure. And I think that, you know, the best way that we can keep ourselves from falling into those traps is to, is to keep love and compassion and peace close to our hearts in, in every way of our being and every step of our lives. And, and that's all I'm trying to do now. I'm, I'm, I'm a much older man now, you know, I'm 53 years old and uh, 54. And, uh, you know, you I was 19 years old <laughs> when I did a lot of the things that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. and so I, I, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of technical difficulties, as you can probably tell in this interview with Wad because he was in a remote location and his internet connection was not that reliable. Nonetheless, we kept trying and uh, so thanks for sticking with us through it. Uh, what we pick up here, uh, you don't hear me ask the question, but I had just asked him about uh, the day prior to the interview where he had joined together with other activists on the Black Lives Matter movement where they painted the words Black Lives Matter in the street, uh, legally, I should note. And uh, so he's telling us all about that. So here we go. You know, it's a painful growth period, I think, for the country, but a necessary one. And uh, uh, I think a lot of that has come out of people's unwillingness to go about their lives in a normalcy that allows them to not think about those things. So I think it's a good thing that, that you know, our lives have been upended and that our priorities have been rearranged and that people are recognizing, you know, things that have been uh, what people have dealt with on a daily basis for hundreds of years in regards to racism and, and destruction of culture. And so, yeah, I'm excited. And uh, um, it's good to be able to talk to somebody like you about it because I don't really uh, interact that much with uh, people off the mountain. I'm um, pretty much practicing being a hermit. Mm -hmm. Are you doing that because of concern for anybody coming after you? I know you've been <laughs> on the run for well, so much of your I, life. I've been waiting a long time to leave the cities. Uh, you know, I spent um, many years living in Michigan so I could be close to my son who was in school and he just graduated from high school. Wow. So it gave me the opportunity to move. And uh, just as it so happens, you know, uh, you know, I was, the way I'm living today is the way I'd be living regardless of the pandemic. This is what I'd be doing anyhow. Mm -hmm. So it just ended up being very serendipitous that I could, you know, um, lean heavily back on my principles and, and start living this way and uh, um, get to know one place intimately you know and get to know connections with my land and water and food and you know those are everything you know it's like just the work i do here every day uh i interact with animals you know whether they be little insects or wasps in our berry patch um and i think that those are my neighbors you know those are all the so that's my my palette it's kind of like uh my uh, um yeah i've been just dealing with a uh, living learning how to live you know, a different way without, without running to the store for every little thing I need or, or going socializing with a friend or, you know, going to see a movie or anything like that. It's like, I haven't been in a movie theater for you know, months and months and months and in a restaurant and I don't miss it one bit. Um, Do you feel like that you're again, getting in touch with your Aboriginal roots by being more in touch with nature and less in this, you know, consumerist society. I know you've always been kind of anti-consumerist and grossed out by conspicuous consumption as 
is ad admirable and I agree with you on that. Absolutely. Do, this is kind of a, like you say, it's been a wake up call that's brought people to realize what's going on with racism, but it's also a wake up call, you know, that might be helping people get in touch with nature in a way that they haven't before. Because one of the only things that we can do is go hiking. That's like, that's what I've been doing. The whole COVID-19 lockdown is going out for hikes. That's where you, know, you can't go to a gym to exercise. And why would you want to when the weather is beautiful and there's trees and mountains and things. So this is um, maybe a wake up call for us in many ways. Absolutely. It's a great time to um, learn new skills and, uh, you know, um, make a priority out of things that used to be just a, a recreational in the past. Like you say, you know, uh, I'm learning what plants are, are happening now so we can harvest, you know, whether it be ramps or berries or, 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 or burdock or echinacea or anything, you know, it's like, it's all about, you know, knowing what, what's happening, what's going on this month, what's, what's, what's flowering, what's, what's popping, you know, are we ready for the apples that are going to come into the tree so we can press them? Are we ready to make the most out of our blueberry patch and make jam? You know, I brought my pressure cooker up here and uh, um, yeah. That sounds so a, awesome. That sounds like the ideal way to live. That's kind of what I wanted to get at with you today. We, we went ahead and we've started this interview without a, a formal introduction, but I went ahead and hit record because you're saying so many awesome things. But this is what exactly what I wanted to get into with you today is, you know, we're with Kindness Magazine, we're talking about making the world a kinder place. And then it's like, well, what would that look like if we were to actually evolve to a place where we were living the way that we're supposed to in, in kindness? That means in harmony and having a loving relationship with all around us, which includes the animals and the plants. And so what you were talking about, which I feel like is very much goes back to your indigenous roots, is living with the land, living with the animals, letting their spirits talk to you, going with what's seasonal. Like you were just yeah, talking about the berries. Uh, it's, it's just not my indigenous roots, it's everybody's indigenous roots. You know, all of us came from a simpler living people and all of us came from uh, an earth-based culture. You know, you only have to go back far enough to find it in, in everybody's culture. And, and, you know, that's the beautiful thing about, you know, Native American spirituality is, is that it doesn't really, that's just the people who have been doing it most recently, but living in harmony with the environment and the earth has been something practiced on many continents. And, uh, and you don't have to be a culture vulture. You don't have to be practicing identically the way that the Lakota or the Yaki or the Shoshone or any particular people do, you know, you can, you know, we're all a blend of different people now. And uh, I love learning from different people, um, you know, whether they be Jewish, indigenous, you know, Muslim or Christians, you know, I, I know that uh, as systems, you know, a lot of these belief, beliefs have problems, you know, and, and especially towards women and animals. Uh, but there's also lots of good to be taken from all of them. And that's one thing I learned from my elders is that, you know, they always interacted with other elders of different beliefs very easily because there's always a strong commonality in every religion and every spiritual way of peace, love, compassion, and understanding for those other beings that you share the world with. And, and so I think that's kind of why I left um, just the, the, the definition of animal liberation or animal rights is because when I was a fugitive from the FBI, I was living on uh, the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota. And uh, um, it instantly put me in a place where I had to learn from the environment and, and, and uh, the environment protected me, knowing, knowing that landscape, knowing that land provided me more, more security than uh, a gun was gonna do, you know, or any, you know, amount of uh, force, you know, I just had to, you know, leave behind that structure and, and go towards something that was more holistic. And, and, and I kind of see myself on the same path now is, is that, you know, it's, it's much more important to me to be living my life in a way that causes minimal harm to others. And, and at the same time, uh, really address, you know, how we can accomplish big changes yes okay yeah so but like one of the things the other things i really enjoy right now brenda is is that 
I've been, uh, um, you know, I do a lot of work uh, taking care of land. And so I have to fix tractors, do construction projects and go get soil from other places. And like, I, I end up interacting with people that are nothing like me. You know, uh, a lot of older white men who are probably Trump supporters. And, but at the same time, you know, we're meeting on a common ground, you know, Mm -hmm. This this logger, you know, provides good topsoil, you know, they're cheaper than any nursery. So I go there and I hang out with him and I chat with him and we connect and, you know, I'm not flapping my politics in his face and he's not flapping them in mine, but, and we're connecting, you know, we're seeing each other as human beings. And, and that's the kind of activism that I really love these days is I love finding commonality with people that are not similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a big reason why I've focused in the last five years in trying to reform hunting practices in Wisconsin is because it's um, it's pretty much impossible to think that we're ever gonna stop a lot of trophy hunting in places like Wisconsin where it's hugely popular. But what we can do is we can definitely change the ways that people do it and get rid of the more horrendous practices like bear baiting and hound hunting. And so, uh, but in order to do that, that means talking to those bear hunters and those hound hunters who who have some common ground you know and who who know that things are out of control and and pretty bad and that if they don't clean up their own act they're going to lose their sport and so it's been a good way to to uh learn how to get along with other people you've always had that ability though you've always been one who was successful at various missions that you took on because you were able to go in not hating everyone that you encountered, but I, I do think that it's, you know, again, as Kindness Magazine, I just have to say, there's the kindness that comes from inside of you that like shines out. And I think that that's another reason why you've been such a popular figure and everyone enjoys hearing you speak so much. What you say, what you experience, the way that you interact with the world comes very much from a place that it feels like of, of love. And you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I know I'm not. That you. You, you feel love for everyone. And that is a huge challenge, especially for a lot of animal rights activists who are very much aware of the animal cruelty that goes on, is we have a hard time forgiving the people who are perpetrators of that violence. Even some people who were previously perpetrators of that violence themselves, sometimes they're the most unforgiving of people who are still doing it once they have reformed themselves they don't want to wait for anybody else to get on board and they immediately start wanting to reject anyone who's not on board with them immediately but you've always had that ability to connect with people on a deeper level and uh i think that's well, thank you so much for saying so. sorry yeah no thank you um you know i try and uh, i think a big part of that has been because uh, my path has, has, has shown me a lot of cruelty and ugliness and violence and very much the things that I don't believe in. And especially in the last few years since I've been working to reform a lot of hunting practices, I've, my primary, one of the primary ways that I, I do this is I, I, I use a fake Facebook account uh, that I've used to befriend hundreds of hunters and I see their world through their eyes, what they share with their friends and it's horrific. And uh, um, at the end of the day, you know, all I want to do is go on a hike and look for some coyote tracks and see these animals living peacefully and, and not have to constantly, uh, you know, for the sake of practicing my principles, be exposed to horrendous cruelty and abuse. Um, you know, it's important to challenge injustice and evil everywhere we find it in the world, but it's also important to recharge our batteries and to not become numb or emotionally, um, you know, uh, paralyzed. I think that, you know, so many people, so many of your followers, so many of my friends, you know, came to, you know, know each other through compassion and love of animals. But yet, you know, we don't have a lot of time to, or we don't have personal relationships with the animals in our home environment. You know, we don't know the habits of the deer, the coyotes, the fishers, the robins, the eagles or anything. And I think that when, when we're able to do that, or at least when I'm able to do that, I really do start to see them as my neighbors and, and it becomes a lot more easier to practice my beliefs uh, because um, I'm, I'm uh, not just putting all my energy into 
those things that I oppose, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I got to come home. I got to, you know, spend some time with my friends and go swimming and, and uh, go kayaking and hiking and just remember that, that this is the most beautiful planet in the world. Right. <laughs> That's kind of a funny thing to say. <laughs> but, you know, I love living here. I love my life right now. And uh, it's a great time to be alive. Um, you know, uh, what's been happening, you know, the statues that are coming down, you know, teams changing their names, you know, me painting Black Lives Matter in big letters in our downtown. It's like, this, that's incredible. I mean, this is such a time for us to be connecting with each other as human beings uh, rather than being divided. And obviously, that's what the government and presidential position is, is just that you're either on that side or the other versus, uh, you know, in these difficult times, finding more allies, you know, or friends and just recognizing that you know, we do need each other, you know, we, you know, and, and, and even sometimes people that might not even look like us or share our same beliefs, you know, but because of our location to them, we share, we are breathing the same air, we're drinking the same water and living on the same land. And, and, you know, uh, very few of us came from where we live, you know, all of us are living on stolen land in one form or another. And so I think it's very important to remember or to keep a level of humility um, and to remember that, you know, we're, we have so much to learn, you know, it's, it's great that we're awakening, but you know, it's, it's just the start. It's just the first step in the path. And, uh, and I love being a part of it and uh, um, being able to, uh, yeah, uh, have the time to, to spend so much time in nature and, and also the work that I've chosen to do the last five years with Wolf Patrol, you know, we're not sitting at desks, you know, or behind computers. Well, we are sometimes, but most of the time we're in the field. You know, we're out there where things are happening. We're seeing things on the ground, what they look like. And, uh, um, and oftentimes, you know, I'll stop and have conversations with hunters who, you know, we start talking about bear ecology, you know, what the bears are eating and what what the season is right now. Well, I hear a lot of people talking about strategy and whether violence or nonviolence is acceptable or not acceptable. But I think that what it really comes down to is what are we trying to say? What is the overall message that we're trying to say? When we say stop torturing animals in these laboratories or we're saying stop skinning animals for their fur. I mean, yes, there is an environmental component to it. But it's, the environmental component also is about having respect, respect for the animals, respect for life, treating them with kindness. And so it's, I always use the analogy of it's like the mother you see in the grocery store that's spanking her kids saying, stop hitting your sister. I'm teaching you not to hit by hitting you right now. It's like that doesn't work. So it's like trying to teach society to be less violent and to be more respectful and more kind by using something that's disrespectful and unkind is not going to work because ultimately we're trying to teach a much larger lesson than any of these. You know, it, it's a huge thing saying, let's get rid of animal experimentation. It's a huge thing saying, let's get rid of factory farming. But it's a small thing on the scale of world peace and world kindness and with uh, everyone dwelling in complete harmony with one another. That has to be the ultimate goal, the big, big goal, you know, and these smaller things that we do along the way to effectuate that goal have to be in line with it. Otherwise, you, you're going to miss out on the end message. I agree with you 100%, Brenda. It's important to remember that even the people that we are opposed to, uh, you know, not all of them go home and beat their children and their wives and kick their dogs. You know, a lot of them go home to a loving family and love their children, kiss them, you know, bed, you know, good night. And, uh, and I think that we can't abandon anybody. You know, we have to appeal to that spark of love and compassion and peace in everybody, mm -hmm. you know, and if anything, it's a, it's, it's a tough nut to crack with some people, but, um, that's ultimately where the real change comes from. You know, I, uh, I deal with a lot of hunters in northern Wisconsin, and um, it doesn't really matter what the laws say, because even though the Endangered Species Act is protecting gray wolves in the state of Wisconsin, they're being killed, they're being poisoned, they're being shot by the people who live in these areas because they do not have the respect and they do not see them 
as a as an ally or as a neighbor or as another conscious being they see them as a as an enemy mm -hmm. and so i really do believe that we have to work to change the way people think and the way people believe uh, and the way they feel uh, before we see a lot of those bigger changes uh, you know system uh, systemic change you know mm -hmm. it all starts on a human level uh, right. and um, and I think that we all have a lot to learn from each other. Right. And, uh, um, well, and I, I hope that we'll... go ahead. I always wanted to, to plug your book, Flaming Arrows. I just got done with reading and I loved it. Um, it's a collection of many of your letters that you wrote from jail and things that you put in your zine and other places where you had uh, opportunities to explain your actions and what was behind it. And I just found it, you know, so touching because, you know, there's, there are many things where you talk about uh, connecting with the animal spirit. You know, there was one beautiful story about when you were releasing the coyotes uh, from a laboratory and actually uh, referring back to, and I, I believe it was, wasn't it Geronimo who, when he was um, performing his medicine, that he would howl like a coyote and kind of take on their energy in his, in his actions to heal. I know everyone thinks of him as being a fierce warrior, which he was, but he was also a healer. And I just think that this, you know, again, I know you say that all people have these connections to the earth if you go back far enough, but you know, we only have to go back 600 years right here on this continent and Native Americans had it down with the learning how to connect with the spirit of these animals. And I just love how you had that happening while you were uh, doing these acts of, of bravery to help these animals. Well, I don't, I don't, can't remember whether I wrote about it in that book, but you know, there was a dark time when I was on the run from the feds, mm -hmm. when I very much thought that I could protect myself uh, through force by carrying a gun, by being prepared when the FBI came to get me. And you know, I had an awakening and that awakening was is that, you know, there are greater powers than us on this planet and that there are greater forces to protect us than anything that man has created and that those powers cannot do a thing for us unless we believe in them unless we invite them into our life and uh, you mentioned geronimo and one of the reasons he's been such a great teacher and hero to me is because he was a medicine man he wasn't a warrior chief he, you know he wasn't a chief he was he was a medicine person and the people that he fought for and the people that he escaped the reservation and always was on the run with weren't other warriors. They were women and children and uh, the orphans of war, people that he just wanted to give a life, mm -hmm. give life back to. Uh, he knew what was going to happen. He knew what was coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And he used to, uh, his followers who were with him said, say that he could, he could call, call darkness. He could call in darkness to help aid the people when they fled. And he would go up to trees and look at the, the buds on the trees and in, in the, the buds he would see faces and he would tell whether it was fortuitous for them to continue or not, but he always turned towards nature for help. And through that, his people survived. I'm sorry for getting emotional. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's a very emotional topic. I mean, the, what his people went through um, and the, I feel like the hurt the, of, of all indigenous people, I, I feel like relates very much to all these things that we're still fighting these days. It's all about somebody trying to dominate, somebody trying to assert control of something. And I, I love the, you know, Native Americans, how blown away they were when white people came here and said, I'm putting a flag here and now I own this. And they would say, how can you own a mountain? How can you own land? How can you own a river? This, is, this belongs to all of us. This nourishes everyone. And this idea of coming in and hoarding and saying, this is mine and I'm excluding everyone else. That is the exact same mentality that we're still fighting or fighting against racism or fighting against sexism or fighting against classism or all of the horrible things that are going on with the disparities that are going on in politics and guess uh, money you know is being hoarded by one percent of people and everybody else is working three jobs to try to make ends meet there this this hoarding that goes on 
is what we're still fighting. And I love that t-shirt with um, the Apache uh, Native Americans on it. It says fighting terrorism since 1492. It's, it's true. I mean, what has happened to our society is a big mess as we're all seeing right now. And I just feel like this is a good time for us to take a step back and say, how can we honor the people who were here 600 years ago and we're doing it right? How can we go to them and say, help us heal what we have done to this land and what we've done to ourselves and teach us your ways? Because you guys were obviously much wiser than the white man was that came in and destroyed all of this. So how we just have to find a way to get back there somehow. It, it's actually not that hard, Brenda. You know, you, you said something that reminded me of uh, something that Albert Whitehead from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe said to me one time. And he said that every plant and every animal has something to teach us if we only are willing to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me about bringing back the sweat lodge ceremony uh, after it had been outlawed in this country. And he said that by the time it was legal again to have the sun dance and sweat lodges, that a lot of the songs had been forgotten and a lot of the, the sacred ways had been lost. And he said he turned to his elders and his elders said, just pray, you know, just go to ceremony, pray, and they will come back to you. And, and they did. He said that, you know, he'd have a dream and a song would come to him or an elder would come and, and say, this is something that my grandfather taught me. But those ways are there. They're, they're still there and they're available. And, and the beautiful thing is, is that it doesn't matter what your blood quantum is. It doesn't matter what your race or ethnicity or gender is. It matters what your heart is. Right. You know, uh, John Trudell, another incredible activist who lost his family in a, in a fire bombing in Nevada in the 1970s for, after he had been national spokesman for the American Indian Movement, he had a term for people like us uh, he said that we're all blue Indians because, you know, we are the people that are called to this healing way to, to the earth to return. We're, we're trying to return home. And, uh, and you mentioned about hoarding, and we all saw that in the beginning of this pandemic, whether it be toilet paper or food that people were gathering and thinking only of themselves very selfishly. You know, that was very much a real thing. But since then, you know, almost every night I am... Uh, encouraged and given hope when I see the beautiful things that people are doing to help each other right now. I mean, through mutual aid, through standing up for injustice, people who are willing to leave their privilege behind and, and go into the streets and be tear gassed and batoned and arrested. It's like, I've been waiting a long time. Yeah, it is a beautiful and It's very encouraging. It is, and, and so as much as we're freaking out because of this pandemic and the bad things that have gone on and all the murders and police brutality, at the same time, this is the thing about humanity is that we're such as a dichotomy. We have this potential for immense good and immense evil. And so, so often how I, um, how I feel on a given day is, how well am I able to focus on the good that's being done? Because there's always some good being done. Even when horrible things are being done, there are always people who are trying to turn it around or trying to do something better. And so focusing our energy on those things, I feel like is how we make it grow. And this, I know you've spent a lot of your life being in a position where you're forced to focus on a lot of bad things that are happening um, and that can be very disturbing and difficult. And I know a lot of activists get burnt out because of that. But I think your method of doing it by connecting with those people and finding the good in them and then focusing on that and trying to help them grow in that way, help them expand their circle of compassion, helping to educate people. That, that's the only way to keep going in trying to make the world a better place. Because if you just focus on the negativity that's going on, it just tears you up. Yeah, it'll eat you up. It'll eat you up alive. And um, I always remember what Martin Luther King said when he said that he was grateful that the Lord told him to love his enemies because he definitely didn't like them. And you know, we don't have to like people, but we do have to love them. And right. we do have to remember he also that said, yeah, he also said hate is too great a burden to bear. 
And I think that that is Absolutely. the problem that a lot of people get into with activism is when you start hating, you're going down a slippery slope. It is a difficult burden to bear and you're going to burn out. So you're much better off focusing on positivity and love and leading by example and looking for the good in others and trying to expand that rather than focusing on bad, 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 shaming and anger. Um, so I, I think you're just such an, an awesome example of all of that. It's amazing well, that you were you called so an eco-terrorist for so long because you're such a, a being of goodness and light in my mind. Well, it's, it's still happening. It still happens. Just uh, last week, I was informed by the state where I'm living that I could not uh, be approved for adoption because of my criminal history. And uh, uh, part of that path for me was about... Uh, once again, following the teachings of people like Geronimo, my own Yaki elders, who are, was always about not protecting yourself, but protecting others, protecting especially the most vulnerable, the elderly, the women. I think a lot of, I think about the immigrant children that are in cages and it breaks my heart. Yeah, me too. You know, I went into immigration law. That's what I'm doing now. And that's what drew me into it. But since I've been doing it, I haven't been able to get near the, the detention centers or help in that area because it's just, it's so sealed off and locked down. I'd almost have to pull a Rod Coronado, you know, surveillance mission and uh, break in there, you know, and the, again, this is why you're such a hero. Is I because about so, it. <laughs> yeah, we all fantasize about stuff like that, and you're like the one person I can say, he he's done stuff like this. You know, you're just an amazing guy, and I don't, you know, I do it for me, child. <laughs> and I know you you say, uh, you know, we all have you know these connections and this sort of thing, but I can't help but think that you have some sort of like special connection to spirit or strategy or something like that from your native american heritage or something do you ever feel uh, that way i don't think so no no i mean i i mean i appreciate what you're saying but i think potentially possibly a lot of it has to do with just the experiences that i've gone through i mean like i've i've seen what it's like to sit in prison for six years and then have no control over your every daily habits and i've seen you know what the dark side, the evil side of people can do. And uh, all of those things have, have made it vital for my survival and for any hope for the future to, to hold on to something else, you know, and to, you know, it, it, it saddens me when I see people who represent compassion and love speaking with anger and hatred towards people who aren't like them. Uh, because I know that that's not what they're in it for. I know that that's at the heart of it. That's not what those people are about. You know, but it's uh, it's 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 been an uh, important lesson of my life is learning how to keep an open heart uh, when we see so much wrong in our world. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a blessing and a curse. But for the most part, it's the one thing that keeps us connected, and the one thing that we can find amongst each other is is, is that commonality of care and love for the, for the innocents and for the vulnerable. And um, I think that, you know, as long as we focus on that and we don't let ourselves get overtaken by the anger or the rage that is very much justifiable, sure. there's a time and a place for that, you know? And I'm glad I'm seeing these statues fall and I'm glad I'm seeing police stations burn and I'm glad I'm seeing people taking a stand because these things need to happen. This is part of the healing process. Yes. You know, there's been a lot of, a lot of this isn't just from our own experiences, but what we carry from ancestral traumas, mm -hmm. you know, because our past generations, you know, my past generations did not have the opportunity to, to see a world in healing like we, you know, they made sacrifices so that we just might live to a day such as today where we could see these kinds of changes happening and, and wrongs righted. And I think that, uh, um, you know, now more than ever, it's important to maintain our moral high ground, whether you be vegetarian, vegan, you know, or Native American or New Age or Republican, is this that, you know, if you keep heart, uh, love and peace in your heart and are motivated by that, people are going to see that, you know, uh, 
Uh, I was going to Black Lives Matter event and a friend of mine was nervous about counter protesters that might be there and, and uh, he was concerned about a uh, need to, to protect me from possible harm. And, and what I was thinking about was, was like, I want to invite those people to join us. You know, I want to like appeal to them. I know that they have children. I know that they're just joining the flock. They're doing what they think is right. But if we were to sit down and share a meal or, or just have a conversation, I bet you there would be a greater chance that we'd be holding up those signs together. Right. That's how we break through this problem with identity politics is people are joining a team, almost like they're joining a gang these days, Republican or Democrat. And if you find out that there, there's a certain thing that people are doing in your group, like it, recycling or wearing a face mask or something like that, or something that people in your group or leaders in your group are not doing, all of a sudden this thing, you haven't even thought about whether it makes sense or not. You're just like, well, I'm on this team, so I'm gonna do that. And that's where a lot of stuff that shouldn't be political gets messed up. And we have no opportunity to evolve as a society because people are taking a team and they're digging their heels in and they're not willing to listen. And I, I really love the whole empathy movement that's going on right now. I don't know if you know about that. There's these people who have empathy tents that they set up. I'm hoping to do an interview soon with the guy who does that here. And they invite people who have divergent viewpoints to sit down and there's these rules where they have to listen to each other speak for five minutes and mirror back what the other person said. And you know, they might walk away and say, well, my mind wasn't changed and I still feel the same way as I did about this issue before, but they still have a little bit of a greater respect for one another. And I feel like that's just, that's what you do. That's your MO. You don't even have to be trained in empathy speak. And you know, that, I feel like you're such a great leader in that manner. So I hope that there'll be another book so you can inspire activists <laughs> to do Thank you. That. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, it reminds me about uh, experience I had. I took a lot of heat for it, but I, I sat down and I had a beer. Finally, he wanted to talk to me, so I went and met him, and we ended up spending the night drinking not just one, but many beers, and, and by the end of it, his girlfriend kept on stopping, and she was just like, wait a minute, I'm confused. She's like, you guys sound like you're the same people like you're concerned about the same thing. You know, she, she was confused that we weren't at opposing ends, you know, that we, that, you know, we had just broken through, you know, and, and of course this guy does a lot of things that I don't like, you know, but I can respect him as a human being and I can have a conversation with him. And he invited me to his wedding and he told me anytime I want to stay with him in Idaho, I can go stay with him. And and I, he's going to be doing what he's doing, but at the same time, he's inviting in somebody unlike himself. Not only somebody unlike himself, but somebody from his opposition. Mm -hmm. He's welcoming me into his camp, and I will never turn down an invitation like that. Two years ago, I was invited to a bear hunter's camp because he was uh, upset that hound hunters, he wasn't a hound hunter, he was a bear hunter that just sat in a tree stand, but, but he had a problem with hound hunters, so... You know, he invited us into his home and he fed us food. You know, we went out and we helped not just his, uh, uh, he was concerned about these hounds running on his private property. So we were there to protect them. And we were also connecting with other landowners too. But we were finding that there's a lot of commonality between people who aren't similar, but we didn't get there without, you know, some humility and without a willingness to want to, you know, go spend time with somebody in the intimacy of their own home, you know, who very much does not look like you or practice the way of life that you do, but, but, but all I lost you for a second there, but I, I think you're back. Um, so I wanted to talk to you. I know that we're, we're talking about politics um, in a more uh, loving way, trying to come together. Um, but I was just wondering, I know you had uh, some ideas about green art anarchy years ago. Do you still feel like that sort of form of government 
uh, would be something that would be more beneficial for us to move towards? Well, I, I definitely still self-identify as an anarchist and everything that I've spoken to you so far in this conversation is a part of my anarchist philosophy. You know, a big part of it isn't about running around and throwing Molotov cocktails. It's about mutual aid. It's about taking care of each other. It's about raising children to not be oppressive towards each other or animals. About seeing that ultimately what anarchism is for me and green anarchism is it's, it's leaning on the natural systems of order, not those made by man. It's modeling nature as a component versus creating structures that aren't based in respect for life. And I don't think that there will ever be an anarchist society, but I do believe that we can have anarchism in our communities and in our families and in our lives, and we can do much good with it at that level. Uh, too often- How do you define anarchism? Just real quick before we go on. I'd say anarchism is, is, uh, is living one's life without the aid of government. Uh, you know, and that means instantly not that you just destroy government, but that you have something else in its place, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, you know, systems that provide education, systems that provide food, systems that provide shelter, systems that provide health care. You know, my friends and community members are people that have formed uh, health care alliances to provide health care in, in street protests and places like Standing Rock and and they're providing food now to people and like that to me is anarchism mm -hmm. you know that to me is where the anarchists are in the streets it's like so it's is, not is just it, it's private organizations is it nonprofit? i mean how how are these services met That's with the beauty of it. It, it it doesn't need to be an organization mm -hmm. or a group it, it's just something that we can practice within our own self you know and it spreads outward you know it's uh you know when when people see us living in a way that's sustainable and peaceful and that works, you know, they're going to they're gonna be drawn towards that, you know. And often, I don't even talk about anarchy because there's too much of a stigma with it, you know. If people knew that they were practicing anarchy rather than just helping somebody build a garden, they might not want to do it. You know? But yet, that's how, that's to me what anarchy is, is, is that it's living without the government, it's living without the need for a system that, was created uh, without the best interests of nature and human beings, but money and property and power and wealth. And mm -hmm. those, it's time for those things to end. So would it be easier to have this sort of uh, living arrangement in, a, in smaller groups, you know, little communities, villages, if you will? I think I've often thought that that's the ideal way is having everybody who lives within a community know each other. So that means that the communities have to be very small so that everybody really can be up in everybody else's business. And then if somebody else is, somebody is polluting the river, you go over there and you talk to them and you say, Joe, why are you polluting the river? You know everybody drinks out of this. So it doesn't have to be a corporation that's faceless and you can't get to the people who run it and then you're doing all these protests, these, you're not being heard. If everybody was really in little small groups, we could all communicate with one another. We could help each other out, like you say, building houses, childcare, all these things. We wouldn't have to worry about, you know, homelessness as much because we could actually help each, each other because it would be a smaller group of people who would need help from another small group of people. And things have gotten just out of control, how huge everything is in our society that it's mind blowing when you think about tackling any one of these problems. Do you think that that is better for your system? Yeah, I think that that's pretty much how it works in, in small, in small pockets and small communities and small gatherings. It's, you know, this, this country cannot be summed up in one principle belief system. We're too diverse of communities, you know, we're too different of people, and that doesn't mean any one is better than the other. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, the Native American maps we used to see in our history books that would show mm -hmm. strong lines, like this was the Apache land, this was the Navajo land, this was the Yaki land, this was the Sioux land, and that's not how we lived. We didn't have borders and fences and walls, you know. You know, people from my tribe used to fall in love with people from across the river. You right. know, some people would be 
uh, stolen because a, a member of their family had been killed by the opposing tribe. And so they took that baby to raise him in that place. And, you know, we, there's lots of gray areas and crossover. And, and in that way, that's how we live. You know, that's how we lived harmoniously with each other. And, and I think that that's very much possible again. I mean, we can let the government do what it wants, but we can live separate from it. You know, we can, we can unplug ourselves from its dependency. And this is the best time to do it right now more than ever. I mean, the amount of people who are turning towards nature right now, looking for ways to make food, make soap, make medicine, you know, it's great. These are all opportunities for people like us who are advocates for these lifestyles to stand up and lead and show by example. And, you know, it's, you know, there's not a lot of uh, 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 need for protest in, in, uh, in a lot of these causes. It's more of a need for working together. You mm -hmm. know, there's, there's, it's great to see protests. I'm, I, I'm not saying I'm against any form of protest right now that's happening in the world, but I'm saying there's going to come a time when we have to set down our signs and start showing by example the world that we believe in. And, uh, you know, those young people in the streets and old people that are making those sacrifices and are getting tear gassed and batoned, you know, it's, they're making that sacrifice so that we can have the opportunity to follow it up with, with the example of the world that we believe in. And, and, and I think that it's a little bit hard when you throw in words like veganism or Native American spirituality, because that might threaten Christian people or non-vegan people or, or Democrats or Republicans, you know. But as long as you walk your talk and you live the way that you believe, that's what those people should see, you know. And then when they get to know you and they're willing to understand you're a human being just like them, then they can remind themselves like, oh yeah, that's right, he's an anarchist, you know, or he's a Democrat or he's a vegan or whatever, you know. But, but I think it's important to first look people in the eye and in the heart and, and remember that we all are stuck on this rock together and trying just to make it. Well, that's a beautiful note to end this on. I definitely think that that's the, the theme, the mission that we're all here um, working towards at Kindness Magazine. And so thank you very much for summing it up so beautifully and for being my guest today. Thank you so much, Brenda. It's been awesome talking to you. I hope it isn't as long before we see each other again. And I just want to say that also uh, for young people who have not learned about people like John Lewis who recently passed, he is one who has led by example. His whole life is a lesson that we can learn from. And it's uh, with great sorrow that he left us, but, but I'm very excited that the world, that he got to see the world as it's changing right now. So thank you and let's get out there and make change happen. Thank you, so beautiful. See you soon. Bye. Please subscribe and ring the bell to stay up to date on our videos. If you are not already subscribed to our magazine, you'll find the link to do so in this video's description.